and welcome to Wednesday in the Word. We are here again live on Facebook. Of course, if you're picking it up later, that's fine. We also do a rebroadcast. Uh, it, well, it's out there, put it that way, for rebroadcast on Facebook later. We also get it on uh, YouTube, so if a person doesn't, you know, get it live, well, you go out there, uh, one of those sources, and uh, you pick it up. And uh, whether you, like we like to say, you know, get it uh, live or, or later, hey, we're so glad that you are with us tonight. So thank you for that. Pastor Kevin here once again. This is Wednesday in the Word for May the 10th, 2023. We are going to get into the Word of God again tonight, as we always do, of course. And before we do that, we want to get the mind of the Lord and have a word of prayer and uh, seek the mind of the Lord, get uh, His direction, get, you know, yield ourselves to the anointing, all of that. So let's pray, and then let's get into the Word of God tonight. Father, we thank You for Your holy written Word. The entrance of it gives us light, it gives us understanding. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. We receive revelation, insight into the word of God tonight. As we will look at in this session, your word is a living thing, alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. May your word probe into the deepest recesses of our hearts tonight so we can align ourselves with you. Father, we thank you for those who will be with us tonight in this time of study, whether they're here live or whether they join us later. Um, makes no difference. We are just thankful that they are there and we can do this and get together by this medium. Now, Father, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what thus saith the Holy Ghost to us tonight. We pray in the precious and the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to our brother Vince, who has uh, popped on there with us, brother. Welcome to, welcome to you. Always good to have you with us, of course. Thank you so much for your uh, faithfulness in studying the Word. Uh, we know that it pleases the Lord, and we greatly appreciate it. And welcome, of course, to the others who will join us, no doubt. And um, now, if I don't get you greeted when you first come on, know that we do go back at the end, as you know, and we welcome those who have joined us for the time of study. Tonight is Principles of Faith, of course, part 14 of our ongoing series, Principles of Faith. I have to tell you, um, I had considered maybe doing one or two more sessions along this line and then maybe moving into our study of First John, which I feel led to go into next. But uh, I tell you, I got to looking at this, and I just know that there are some principles of faith. There are some things that we really need to get into our heart. And uh, so we're going to be in this for a while longer. Um, and I trust that it's been a blessing to you and will continue to be so, of course. But uh, principles of faith, part 14, we're going to jump into another area tonight along this line. We're going to start on seven steps to developing strong faith. Now, this will be part one of that, but seven steps to developing strong faith. And I want to welcome our sister Glenda. She says, good evening. Looking forward to study God's word. Praise the Lord for that. A welcome to our sister Diane and our brother John there, no doubt, who's with you. Welcome to you folks, and thank you for coming on with us tonight. Amen. But seven steps to developing strong faith, and this will be part one. Now, a lot of what we will look at in this session, we've already looked at in one form or fashion or another. Um, we've looked in it, you know, things in this session have been covered to some extent already. But I wanted to bring them together in one. Now, again, we're not going to get through all seven of these tonight, but I wanted to bring it together into one section of study so that um, we could check up on the progress of our faith walk and the progress, the progress really that we're making in our faith walk, I should say, and get ready for our exam. 
so to speak. And somebody says, wait, an exam? No one said anything about an exam. I didn't sign up for an exam. There's going to be a test. Now, wait a minute. That's not what I'm talking about. Let me explain what I mean by that. You know, as you've studied along, as we have studied along on these teachings on faith, and they have taken hold in your heart, and I pray that they have and are doing so, well, I got to tell you, whenever you make progress in any area in the things of God, in the, in, especially in the study of faith, know that the devil is going to contest you. He's going to test you uh, about your steadfastness in the Word. Now, you know and I know that we have an adversary, the Bible tells us that, who seeks to uh, devour anyone who he may. Well, I tell you what, the Lord wants us to be prepared for Satan's wiles. And the way that we are prepared for Satan's wiles is to know the Word of God, to know the truths that we're going to be looking at in this section will make you ready when the wiles of the devil come knocking, and they will. Amen. All right. You can be fully prepared. I want you to know for any situation or circumstance that may arise in your life. That is why we're going to run this checkup on our own lives and our faith walk so we can keep pressing on to strong faith. Can you say amen? I believe that's what we want. We want strong faith. We don't want, we don't want feigned faith. We don't want weak faith. Amen. We don't want sometimes faith. We want strong faith. Well, we're going to look at how to develop that and how to walk in that. There are seven steps I want you to know to developing strong faith, the faith that takes God at his word and gets results. That's what I'm talking about when I say strong faith, the faith that takes God at his word no matter what's happening, no matter what is going on, no matter what you feel like. Amen. The faith that takes God at his word and gets results is strong faith. And that's what we're talking about. Now, in this session, we will discuss the first three steps. Okay. Step number one, let's get right into this. Step number one is know the integrity of God's word. Know the integrity of God's word. Now, to obtain and walk in strong faith, here's where we begin. You must know and be settled on the integrity of God's word. You must know that God's word is exactly what it declares to be. The word is a revelation from God to us. Amen. The Bible, check this out, is God speaking to us now today. Amen. You've heard me say it before. We need to take the attitude that the Bible is God speaking. The Bible is God speaking to me, and the Bible is God speaking to me now. Amen. The Bible is God speaking to us now. Okay. The Bible is not only a book of the past. Now, we know that the Bible does uh, cover history. Amen. About a third of the Bible, in fact, is history. There are historical books. There's a whole section of the what's known in Hebrew as the Tanakh, or what we typically refer to as the Old Testament. There's an entire section that is historical books. Amen. And about a third of the Bible is history. Well, but the Bible is not just a book of the past. No, thank God it covers history, and it does so accurately, by the way. But it is not just a book of the past, nor is the Bible only a book of the future. We know about a third or a little more of the Bible is prophecy and does look into the future. And I got to tell you, God knows more about the future than any of us or anyone else knows about the past. Amen. God, the Bible says, he is the one who declares the end from the beginning. And, and I'll tell you, God uh, knows the future. Why? Because he's already been there. And it turns out all right. He's declared what it's going to turn out to be. Amen. Well, okay. Now, it's not so the Bible is not only a book of the past. It's not only a book of the future. It's both of those things, yes. 
but it is a book of the now. This book, I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to hold up my Bible here. This is my big, large print Bible, but I'm going to hold it up nonetheless. Amen. This book, okay, this book, um, this book is the Bible, is a God-breathed, a God-indwelt, and a God-inspired message. I want to say that again. This book, the Bible, if hope, I hope you have your Bible right there. This book, the Bible, is a God-breathed, a God, now notice this terminology, a God-indwelt and a God-inspired message. In fact, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. What does the writer of Hebrews say about the Word? Well, we're going to find out. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm going out there myself, in fact. Okay. Hebrews chapter 4, 12. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. If you have something else, that's okay. It'll read much the same. We'll come out the same place at the end. Hebrews 4, 12, though, says in the King James, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Boy, I'm telling you, we could camp on Hebrews 4.12 and get a lot of revelation there. We're not going to, but I just wanted you to know there, or notice, I should say, that it says, for the word of God is quick. Now, um, that is an old English word. Well, I'm, uh, let, me, let me back up. I, I, I'll say something about that in a moment. But first of all, I noticed that the Moffat's New Testament reads, for the logos word okay, of God is a living thing. That clarifies it for us, doesn't it? Why? Because the word quick in our King James Version, guess what? Equals living. You know, we, we don't use the word quick like that anymore in uh, modern vernacular, but in 1611 English, the word quick meant alive. You know, the Bible says that God's going to judge the quick and the dead. Well, he's going to judge the living and the dead. Well, guess what? When the dead are judged, they're not going to be dead anymore. <laughs> they're going to be raised to stand before God at the great white throne. But he's going to judge the quick and the dead, or he's going to judge the, 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 the those who have died in Christ will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Anyway, um, but he will judge the quick, the living, and the dead. Well, that word quick then means living. So, the writer of Hebrews, let me get a quick drink. Praise the Lord. The writer of Hebrews is telling us that the Word of God is a living thing. Amen. Now, but it will only, here's what you have to understand, but it will only come alive to you and work in your life or work in my life as we accept it and act upon it. I tell you what, the word will not come alive to you if it's just sitting on your coffee table. Amen. The word won't come alive to you if it's just sitting on a shelf gathering dust. The word won't come alive to you if you just keep a small copy in your glove box thinking it's going to be like a good luck charm for you. No, the word of God only comes alive to you as you accept it and as you act upon it. Amen. Being a hearer, of not, being not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. Amen. All right, so to settle on the integrity of God's word is the first step to walking in strong faith. I don't mind telling you. The word of God should be of foremost importance in your life and my life. Amen. You know, the, the opinion of your friends, the, the, the opinions of your family, even what your church may teach, and I'm not speaking disparagingly of that, but I'm just telling you 
that no matter what, the word should be of foremost importance in your life. What does the word say about that? What I'm thinking about, what I'm dealing with, what I'm you know needing to do. What does the word say? What about what I need in my life? What does the word say about that? Make that the foremost thing in your life. Now, this is important. I want you to tune in to me right now. This is not a time to be kind of spacing off. I want you to, not that you are, but I just want you to really pay attention to what I'm about to say. This is important. If you get our notes, I put this is important right before where we're going right now. So please listen. Sometimes I've noticed, and, and you know what? I got to tell you, I can talk about this because I am in this camp, okay? I am a Pentecostal. Um, you know, people talk about what they identify as anymore. Well, I identify with and as a Pentecostal believer, a Pentecostal Christian, okay? I believe in the Pentecostal experience, and that includes, by the way, the modern-day operation of all nine of the gifts of the Spirit, as outlined in 1 Corinthians 12. It covers all of the motivational gifts of Romans chapter 12, and it covers all five of the ministry gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher of Ephesians 4. Okay, I believe in the operation of the Spirit today. Okay, I do not believe, I'm not a cessationist, I do not believe that the gifts of the Spirit ceased with the death of the last apostle or the completion of the New Testament canon, okay? We don't teach that. Now, I, I, I wanted to preface that because of what I'm about to say. Sometimes people feel that God hasn't spoken to them unless they have received a message in tongues or a prophecy, okay? In fact, I've had people say to me, well, Pastor Kevin, I, I just don't hear God's voice like a lot of people do. And what they mean by that is they don't get a prophecy a day. They don't get a leading of the Holy Spirit, you know, audibly or, you know, on the inside necessarily every day. Say, turn here, do this, don't do that, wear this today, don't wear that, have this for lunch, you know, that type of thing. There's a lot of people that claim to have that type of a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's just talking to them all the time. Um, well, I, I, I won't comment on that. But anyway, a lot of people feel like unless they're hearing a message in tongues or a prophecy that God hasn't spoken to them, or they're not hearing God's voice. But check this out. But God's Word, now I'm talking about God's Word, the Bible, okay? Okay. God's Word, the Bible, is God speaking to us. If you open up and read your Bible, that is God speaking to you. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in utterance in tongues and prophecy and all the rest. But check this out. The Bible is God speaking to us. And if you really want to hear God's voice, read your Bible out loud. Amen. You'll hear God's voice. Why? Because the Bible is God speaking to us. Now, and this is important too, and tongues and interpretation or prophecy are not, N-O-T, are not to be put above the holy written word of God. I'll go so far to say something else. Nor are they to be placed on a plane equal with the written word of God? Prophecy and tongues and utterances uh, purporting to be of the Holy Spirit, guess what? They have to be judged, and they are judged by the word of God. And we're going to say more about that in a minute, but I, I'm going to want to put that out there. Okay, but the word comes first, okay? Tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, these are inspirational vocal gifts to inspire us, watch this, in line with the Word of God, with the written Word of God. Now, 
someone asks, well, what if someone gives an utterance that is not in line with the word? Well, then it is not, this is a simple answer, then it is not the Holy Spirit in manifestation. I don't care if they say, thus saith the Lord. I don't care if they shake and quiver and shake their head and roll on the floor, whatever they do, and sound authoritative. If what they say doesn't line up with the written word of God, it is not the Holy Spirit in manifestation. Why? Because the Spirit and the word always agree. Because guess what? The Spirit is the author of the word. He breathed on holy men of old who wrote down what he moved upon them to write. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, what, what what's going on though? What is it then? If it's not the Holy Spirit in manifestation, what is it? Well, a couple things. A, someone speaking out of their own spirit or their own thinking. They think God's speaking to them or it's something that's just coming up out of their own spirit, and they're attaching a thus saith the Lord to it. That's one possibility. Or B, someone speaking with or by a wrong spirit. How many of you know you can yield to the Holy Spirit, but you can yield to a wrong spirit too if you're not discerning and don't know the word? Didn't the Bible say, 1 John chapter 4, 1, believe not every spirit, why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Amen. See, everybody who purports to give some kind of supernatural utterance, they are speaking either by the Spirit of God or their own spirit, or they are speaking, check this out now, or they have yielded somehow to an evil spirit. That's possible. Amen. Don't not teaching on that tonight, but that's a possibility. Okay, boy, I gotta. If I don't hurry up, I'm not gonna even get through three of these tonight. Praise the Lord. Oh well, we'll just get through what we can. Now, we need again. I said a moment ago, and I'm gonna reiterate it here. We need to judge these things in the light of the written word, as we are, by the way, told to do. Amen. We're told to judge these things, and we must do that, and we judge them in line, in the light of the holy written word of God. Okay, amen. Now, when you begin to study the word for yourself and accept it as it is, you will wonder, I'm telling you, why you believe some things the way you did. It is astounding. I don't mind telling you if I can use that terminology. It is astounding some of the things that people believe that aren't in the Word at all. Amen. All right. Step number one, then, is to know the integrity of God's Word. Here's step number two. Step number two, know the reality of your redemption in Christ. Know the reality of your redemption in Christ. Now, most of us who have been in the Christian church for any length of time, we've heard terms like the redeemed. We've heard terms like redemption. Amen. We might even know the old song, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed uh, uh, what, what, what is that? Uh, uh, amen. I, I had it a while ago. Uh, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, be de redeemed by His excellent grace. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed in His child forever I am. Anyway, well, it says redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Well, guess what? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, that we are we, in Christ, we are redeemed by his blood, which is the forgiveness of sins. Peter wrote it. He said, you were not redeemed by corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation, but by the precious blood of Christ. So the old song's right. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Amen. The blood of the lamb was the redemption price. It is what purchased our redemption. But here's the thing. 
we must know and should understand redemption not just as a doctrine, not as a philosophy or a creed of some kind, thank God for all of those things, but we should know, watch this, that in Christ we have been redeemed from the authority of Satan. Now, turn over to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, if you would. Now, while you're doing that, I want to tell you that there are four different Greek words from which redeemed or redemption or some variation thereof is translated from. Now, I'm not, I'm, going to I'm not going to cover all four of those Greek words, but just know that they paint a picture of a slave in a slave market on the auction block being auctioned off to the highest bidder to go into slavery, okay? Then someone comes along and has the highest bid, and they bid on that slave and win and take that slave off the, off the market block there. And But instead of taking them home and subjecting them to further slavery, they in turn set that slave free. They have redeemed them. They have delivered them from captivity through the paying of a ransom. That is the picture that the four Greek words translated redeem or redemption in the New Testament paint for us, okay? Now, with that, let's look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Amen. Colossians 1.13, the Apostle Paul is writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and, well, I needed to be in Colossians, not in Philippians. Amen. Thank God for Philippians, but I wanted to be in Colossians 1.13. Here's what Colossians 1.13 says. It says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, here's what you have to understand. We need to understand redemption, again, not just as a doctrine, not as a philosophy or a creed, but we need to understand that in Christ, we have been translated, watch this, we have been, um, we have been redeemed, okay, from the authority of Satan. For in the new birth, okay, we have been translated into the kingdom of God's Son, the kingdom of God. In other words, we have been placed into the very family of God. Amen. That's happened to you if you're in Christ Jesus. You said, I didn't, I didn't know all that happened. Well, it did. Amen. That's why you need to understand it. That's why you need to know it. See, we have been delivered from Satan's kingdom. You say, well, I didn't know I was ever in Satan's kingdom. Well, you were. Amen. And so was I. Now watch this. Look at verses 12. So let's back up to verse 12 there, that same opening, and get a little more context here. Beginning at 12. Okay, here it is. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, M-E-E-T, meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, verse 14 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. Well, let's get some understanding here, shall we? Look at that word meet, M-E-E-T, in verse 12. See, that word is an example of an old English word that doesn't mean now what it did in 1611 when the King James translators translated the King James Version. You know, Meet today in modern vernacular is to be introduced to someone, to meet them. That's, you know, a primary meaning. There's other, you know, variations we could get into. But uh, 
but that's what meat, M-E-E-T, today primarily means. But in 1611, it meant something else. And uh, I did some comparison here with some other translations to get it really a clarification of what we're looking at here. The um, A faithful version, the AFV translation, translated that, giving thanks to the Father who has made us qualified. Well, that's good. All right. Uh, the, the complete Jewish Bible says, giving thanks to the Father for having made you fit. That's good, too. That's the complete Jewish Bible. One more here. The Jubilee Bible says there, giving thanks unto the Father. Check this out. Who has made us worthy? Yeah, all of those are really good. All of that translates the Greek word, hey, kunao, hey, uh, let me try that again. He kunao. He kunao. So it sounds almost like something from Hawaii. He kunao. He kanunao. All right. Hey, you try saying that three times fast. All right. But what it means <laughs> is to make sufficient, render fit, qualify. Now, you say, well, I don't feel I qualify. I don't feel fit. I don't feel worthy. It has nothing to do with feeling worthy because what he's talking about here, this speaks of our standing. Check that out now, that terminology, standing. This speaks of our standing, not necessarily always of our character. Do we always act worthy? Do we always act fit? No, but we have been made that. That is our standing in Christ Jesus because of the blood of the Lamb. He has made us qualified, amen, to be in the family of God. Wow. My, my, my. Now, whoo, hallelujah. Now, because of this, okay, because of this, we are able to, to be partakers of our inheritance, and we can enter into our inheritance in Christ. Now, look at verse 13 again. He says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, what did he say? What did he say there in verse 13? Who hath, H-A-T-H in the King James, who hath translated us. Well, how many of you know hath is the old English equivalent to our word has? Now, what tense is a word like hath or has? What tense is that? It's past tense. If something has been done, if something has occurred, that is in the past tense. Well, he said, who hath delivered us? Okay, all right. God is not going to deliver us. It says he has already delivered us when we were born into God's kingdom. Now, the word translated power here means authority. It's that Greek word exousia, and it means authority. Okay, so in other words, we could read this, Scripture, who hath delivered us from the authority of darkness. Now, darkness means everything that Satan is, okay? If you want to see a perfect picture of darkness, then the only place you have to look is what the Bible says about our adversary, the devil. Everything about him is darkness. I got to tell you, when he rebelled against God in the dateless past, his light was put out, okay? There's no redemption for him. I don't care what some of my friends say. There is no redemption for him. He has sealed his fate. His light went out, and now everything about him is darkness. His kingdom is darkness. He is darkness. Everything he does is darkness. And so when the Bible talks about darkness, it's talking about everything that Satan is, the kingdom of Satan. In Christ, we have been delivered 
from the power or authority of Satan's kingdom. That's already been done. It's already happened, okay? Now, notice verse 14, would you, if you would. In whom? In whom, in whom who? Christ. Hey, say that three times fast. In whom who? Amen. That sounded all, well, anyway. In whom who? Christ. In whom we have, er, pardon me, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Therefore, I want to announce to you tonight, Satan cannot over, lord it over you as the, a believer, for we have been redeemed. We have been delivered. We have been taken out of his kingdom and transferred, translated into the kingdom of the Son of God. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Now, let's notice again Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Boy, I love this scripture. Amen. Someone says, Are there any scriptures you don't love? I haven't found one. Amen. <laughs> Revelation 12, 11. Don't, don't think I will either. Revelation 12, 11. The Bible says, and they overcame him. Him who? Him, the Antichrist, and his cohorts, okay, in the Great Tribulation. That's what it's talking about. And they overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb. And by what? And by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Now, I looked this up in the American Standard Version, ASV, okay? And in the ASV, this reads, and they overcame him, watch this, because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. Boy, I like that. See, here's what you need to understand. The blood of Jesus, beloved, is the basis of our victory. It is the basis for our victory. But you see, now watch this. This is important. We have to add our testimony to that, or we could say you have to add your confession to it. I want to submit to you. I want to submit to you when the Bible says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. I want to submit to you the word of their testimony about the blood. Amen. All right. Now, I'm put that out there for you to consider. Okay. You have to stand your ground, and I have to stand my ground against the enemy with your confession of faith in God's word because Satan is the God of this world, and he will try to have authority over you. Okay. Yes, Satan will try to exercise his authority over you in this life, but you simply have to know that you have been delivered, have been delivered um, from, um, from the power of darkness, amen, and from the authority of Satan through or because of the blood of Jesus. Now, here's a big area. The Bible says, Galatians 3.13, Christ hath, there's another one of those, hath, hath, he's already done it, hath delivered us, or, or hath redeemed us, pardon me, from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is every man who hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith. Okay, here it is. Now, one of the areas that you have been redeemed from, I want to announce to you, is sickness. You have been redeemed from sickness. Now, I know that that gets feather, feathers ruffled when I say it. You know, I've even had people say to me, well, Brother Kevin, our spirits belong to the Lord all right, but our bodies haven't been redeemed yet. So we'll have to go right on suffering sickness and disease in the physical realm in this life. The time is coming when we won't have to suffer with sickness and disease, but that time hasn't come yet. Well, I hate to tell those folks that or this, but that's simply not in the Bible. In fact, 
the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? In other words, that's like Paul saying, what? What? Okay, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple, or what? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I'm here to tell you, despite what religious teaching says, sickness does not bring glory to God. Now, a person who is sick, a person who is suffering, bless their heart, they may glorify God right in the midst of their sickness and their trouble. Hey, that's what we ought to do. But I'm here to tell you on the authority of God's word that the sickness itself does not glorify God. Okay? Now, I'll put a disclaimer out here. Okay? Here it is. We have not received our glorified bodies yet. We are not immortal yet, okay? We're going to receive a glorified body at the rapture and resurrection, okay? When the dead in Christ are raised and the, those who of us are alive, which I believe to be in that number, who are alive and remain or are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, we're going to get a glorified body fashioned unto his glorious body, okay? We then will be immortal, but we're not immortal now. In fact, if Jesus tarries his coming for many years, okay, I don't believe he will, but if he did, every one of us will go the way of death. You know, it's been said that life is a, is a terminal condition. You can't get out of it alive, okay? And you can't. The one exception to that will be the rapture, amen? But if you live long enough on this earth without the Lord coming again to receive us, we're all going to die. Why? Because we're not immortal. I acknowledge that, okay? I'm going to give you another one. There are some effects of aging, yes, that we deal with. You're not in a glorified body. The Bible says this outward man is perishing day by day, but on the inside, on the inner man, we're being renewed day by day as by the Spirit of the Lord, okay? You will affect, you will experience, pardon me, some effects of aging. We all do. I like something I heard said last night. I heard it, <laughs> I thought this was good. Uh, I was listening to Flashpoint, and Lance Walnow said, he says, yeah. He says, I was looking in the mirror, and I saw I'm losing some hair. I've got some pattern baldness, baldness going on. He says, he says, I think it's, he says, I think it's uh, climate change, and my hair's moving south. Huh. Well, I think mine is too, if, it, if that's the case. But see, we will. Amen. I have less hair today than I did yesterday. Hair today, gone tomorrow. Okay? Uh, that, that's a result of aging. Your face gets wrinkled. Things sag. I'm not going to go into all that. But that, yeah, there are some effects of aging that we deal with. But I'm just telling you that you don't have to, watch this, this is, this is revolutionary thinking. You do not have to leave this earth, this planet, if you go the way of death. You do not have to leave this world sick or full of disease. You can fill, fulfill the number of your days and just fall to sleep, fall asleep in Jesus. Okay, amen. Now, all right, step number three. Hope I can get, I think I can get through all this. I, I'm there. Step number three, okay, we looked at know the integrity of God's word, know the reality of your, uh, of your redemption. Step number three, know the reality of the new creation. To obtain and walk strong in faith, we need to know the reality of the new creation and the, note this terminology, legal side of redemption. You need to know that in the mind of justice, in the mind of God, because of what Christ Jesus hath accomplished, we were recreated in Christ Jesus. You should also know the reality of the new birth vitally as a reality for yourself. You should know and understand that the moment, check this out, the moment 
you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, rather, and confessed Him as your Lord, you were recreated. That is when the legal act of redemption, which was wrought in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, became a reality in your own life. Watch this. In the new birth, you have in your spirit. Watch this now. Check the terminology out. I said in your spirit, the very life and the very nature of God. My, my. The new birth is not just an experience. It is not a religion. It is not joining a church. And don't take that that Pastor Kevin says it's, it's not important to join a church. Hey, I am a pastor. I believe in joining the church, okay? I'm just telling you that the new birth is not a religion, nor is it joining a church, okay? No, it is the actual rebirth of our spirits. We are the very sons and daughters of Almighty God. Wow. Wow and double wow. <laughs> he is our very own Father. We are His very own children. We know that we have passed out of Satan's dominion his dominion, which is spiritual death, into the realm of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, look at, if you would, 1 John. You're already in the book of Revelation there a moment ago. Let's flip back just a few pages to 1 John. And we're going to look at 1 John, not the Gospel of John now, the Epistle of John, the first one, chapter 3, and verse 14, please. First John 3, 14. All right, here's what the Bible says. We know, I love that, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. You Now, now check this out. What did he say? We know we have passed from death into life. We have entered the family of God. And here's what you need to understand. You cannot join, notice that, notice that terminology, you cannot join the family of God. You are born into it. You were born into the family of God. Now, what will be the effects of this knowledge of the reality of the new birth and the new creation. What will be the effects of that? Well, in the new birth, God becomes your very own father and you are his very own child. You have, watch this, this is going to sound radical to you, and this might give your religious mind, if you've got a religious mind not renewed by the word, it might give your religious mind a little fit, but hang on. You have, watch this, as much freedom to fellowship with the Father as Jesus had in his earthly walk. Why? Because, buckle your seatbelt, because God loves you even as he loved Jesus. He does not love you and me in a different manner. He does not love us on a different level. No, he loves you and he loves me as children of God just as much as he did his very own begotten son. You say, whoa, whoa, my mind sets down on me in that one. Well, I can show it to you in the word. I wouldn't say it if it wasn't in the word. Go back to the gospel of John now. Whoo. Chapter 17, verse 23. John 17, verse 23. I'm going to show you this in the Word. You might want to highlight this in your Bible. Amen. Or cut it out, I guess, if you don't believe it, but I hope not. John 17, 23 says, This is in the context of the high priestly prayer of Jesus that he prayed. This is really 
the Lord's Prayer. The prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer is really a model prayer, the disciples' prayer. This is truly the Lord's Prayer. It's his high priestly prayer of John 17. Verse 23 says, I in them and thou in me, he's praying to the Father, that they may be made perfect in one. And watch this, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Wow. Amen. Now that's in your Bible, is it not? All right, get a hold of it. Amen. Don't pass judgment, beloved, on God's creation. <laughs> we didn't make ourselves who we are and what we are. God did. We didn't make ourselves who we are and what we are. God did. And I tell you, you had better be careful, and I had better be careful about passing judgment on God's creation. You know, folks have thought they were being humble when they say, oh, I'm so unworthy. But God didn't make, you better hear me tonight, I'm running low on time, but God didn't make any unworthy new creations. Okay? You see, if you say you're unworthy, you are not looking at things the way God does, and you are not living in line. I don't mind telling you, you're not living in line with the epistles which were written to you as a member of the body of Christ. Many people look at things from the physical or the natural standpoint, but I'm not unworthy because I am in Christ, and you, I'm here to announce to you, are not unworthy either. Now, if I happen to be speaking to someone who doesn't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, you've not entered the family, you're still in the kingdom of darkness, and maybe you've just come across this tonight or whenever you see it. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can pass from death unto life too. It's as simple as making Jesus the Lord of your life. The Bible says if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that is, Jesus be Lord of my life. Jesus, you take control. You uh, call the shots in my life and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You would be saved for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. That's right standing with God and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. So if you don't know Jesus, I would say receive him just right now. Call out to him. The Bible says all who call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. All right. Woo. Hallelujah. We are God's workmanship. Talking about those who are in Christ Jesus, okay? We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Quit looking at yourself from the natural standpoint. Keep, look, keep looking at yourself in Christ, and I'm here to tell you, you'll look much better. God the Father doesn't see you like anyone else sees you. He sees you in Christ. He sees us through the blood. He sees us in His Son. Now, what defeats people, I don't mind telling you is that they're looking at themselves and others, by the way, from the natural standpoint. You and I, hear me, have no right to do that. We need to look at things the way God does. And he tells us how he sees us, by the way, in his word. Amen. Well, that's really all the time we have tonight. Lord willing, we'll pick this up next time and look at some more good stuff. I think this has been some good stuff tonight. Hey, um, if you've got any comments or questions, I want to encourage you to type those in. We've been pretty quiet tonight on the comment side of things, but uh, that's all right. Uh, that is all right. 
I want to go back and say hello to Vince. I want to go back and say uh, hello to Sister Glenda. Good evening. Looking forward, she says, to study God's word. I want to say hello to Diane and Brother John, Sister Diane and Brother John. They're the only ones who chimed in tonight. If there's anybody else out there and you didn't make your presence known, well, welcome. Only way I have, I got to tell you, um, to know that you're out there, even if you are out there, the only way I know it on my end in this um, live producer, Facebook live producer, is uh, if you chime in like Tom just did. Welcome to Tom, Brother Tom. He says, good Bible study. Thank you, brother. Thank you for being there, my friend. We appreciate that. Hope all is well with you and your world. Amen. Well, I tell you what, if you have any other comments or questions, please chime those in at this time. I uh, want to let you know, Sunday morning at the church, 10 a.m. at the Boone, C-O-G-O-P, Church of God of Prophecy, um, we will, um, Brother Vince says, very good, thank you, brother, um, we will be having church, obviously, Lord willing, if Jesus doesn't come first, 10 o'clock Sunday morning, we're at 2028 Crawford here in Boone, that's right in the corner of 21st in, and Crawford. We're right across the street from Franklin School. Very easy to find, really. Um, but we want to invite you, if you can, to come out. Hey, Sunday is Mother's Day. Yeah, this coming Sunday, as is, is we're live here, this coming Sunday is Mother's Day. It's the day that we set aside to honor the woman without whom, by the way, none of us would be here, right? Amen. And the Bible says, honor your father and mother that your days may be long on the earth that the Lord your God gives you. That's the first commandment, the Bible says, with a promise attached to it. So we honor our fathers and our mothers. We take a day in this country to honor our mothers and our fathers. Well, this Sunday is Mother's Day. So uh, we want to welcome out all of our mothers. We will be honoring you on that day, your day. So come out if you can. If you can't, make it with us physically. Well, we, um, of course, do live stream our service, same place you pick up this study on Wednesday night. You can get our live stream right from the church, or you can catch the rebroadcast of it on our church page, Boone, church, Boone Iowa Church of God of Prophecy Facebook. Also put it out there, Kev, Pastor Kevin E. Johnson on YouTube. You can get it there. We try to get it out as many places as we can so that you have the opportunity to see and partake of the service. Well, anybody else with a comment or a question? Glenda says, good study. I like knowing that God sees me in Christ Jesus. Amen, sister. I like that too. I'm glad he doesn't see me in the natural realm. No, he sees me in Christ. He sees me and he sees you. He sees us all as his children through the blood. Amen. Through his son. Amen. Boy, I tell you what, that is good news. That ought to just get you going. Amen. To know what the Father thinks of you and says about you. I don't know if you'd ever seen that in the Word before, what Jesus said there in John 17, 23, but you ought to highlight it in your Bible. You ought to asterisk by it. You ought to circle it. You ought to put that in your heart because he says that, that, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved them me. Boy, that is revolutionary. I'm telling you the first time I saw that in the Word, I said, how can that be? But hey, that's what Jesus said. Amen. That's what he prayed to the Father. And it is the truth. Amen. So boy, get that on the inside of you that Jesus, uh, the Father rather, sees and loves you as his child, just like he does Jesus. Wow. That is almost too good to be true, but it is true. Amen. Well, any other comments or questions that we have tonight? Go ahead and chat those in. I'm going to give you about a, a few seconds more just to get that in. We won't belabor the point. But if you do have something else, uh, we want to make sure we address it and uh, get it uh, you know, looked at for you. Anyone else with anything else, question-wise, comment-wise, prayer request-wise, anything like that tonight, testimony-wise, um, get that out there. Let us know if you would. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, 
It's been Pastor Kevin once again with you here on this Wednesday night. So glad to have been here with you again and uh, glad to have you there with us. We are so appreciative of the opportunity um, to come together with you on this medium of a Facebook Live and then, you know, Facebook in general um, to have this opportunity to, you know, share the word with you. Well, it's straight up at eight o'clock central time uh, here and uh, our time is gone. So I just want to say this to you. Um, what is a glorified body, Brother Tom asks? Well, another way to say that is a resurrection body. In other words, the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise. For If you look in 1 Corinthians 15, brother, it talks about the resurrection body that, that we will receive. It describes it. But when I say glorified body, I'm talking about that resurrection body that we will receive if we are among the dead in Christ. Well, we're going to be raised and receive that body. Or um, if we are alive in Christ as we're caught up to be with the Lord in the air, then we'll get this body. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, we'll not all sleep, we'll not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Well, that change is going to be that new body fashioned unto his glorious body that won't age, it won't die again, it won't, uh, it, it will be immortal. It won't, it won't be a flesh and blood body, but it will be a flesh and bone body like his body. And, you know, the physics and all of that that govern uh, heaven uh, that, you know, the things that affect us here, like gravity and time and space and all that, uh, apparently won't affect that body. So when I say a glorified body, I'm talking about the resurrection body that we will receive at the coming of the Lord or at the resurrection. So hope that answers that, brother, and thank you for asking that. I greatly appreciate it. You know, sometimes I might use a term, I know what I mean by it, but if another person doesn't, I, I want you to ask. So thank you, my brother. I greatly appreciate that, the chance to uh, clarify that a little bit. Okay, well, I just want to speak this over you tonight. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We bless you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. I want to remind you of these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that this is... Uh, pardon me, whatever is born of God, almost got ahead of myself, whatever is born of God, 1 John 5, 4 says, overcomes the world. And this is the, the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Thank you for being here. The Lord bless you, and we'll see you soon. Amen.